Part One, Chapter Ten of the Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume One, by Edward Tyus Cook. Freedom, Paris, and Harley Street, eighteen fifty three to October eighteen fifty four lo as some venturer from his stars receiving promise and presage of sublime emprise wears evermore the seal of his believing deep in the dark of solitary eyes f w h myers the institution in which florence nightingale was to serve her apprenticeship in paris was the maison de la providence belonging to the sieur de la charite in the rue oudineau faubourg saint germain the abbe de Jeannette described in a letter to Manning the attractions which would offer to his protege. The principal house, managed by twenty sisters, received nearly two hundred poor orphans, and also conducted a creche. A hospital was attached to it next door for aged and sick women. Within ten minutes' walk, Miss Nightingale would find two other hospitals, one a general hospital, the other a children's hospital the english demoiselle would conform in accordance with her desire to the rules of the house as a postulant rendering all necessary service to the sick the only restrictions were that she would not be able to enter the refectory or the dormitory of the sisters she would have to sleep and take her meals in her own room but she would be free to visit the poor in company with the sisters to serve the sick under their direction in various hospitals and infirmaries and to assist in the care of the orphans alike in class and at play such was the life in paris to which miss nightingale was looking forward eagerly she left london for paris on february three eighteen fifty three with her cousin miss bonham carter and they stayed with monsieur and madame mole in the rue de bac before entering the maison de la providence miss nightingale desired to visit and study other institutions in paris she was armed with a comprehensive permit from the administration generale de l'assistance publique to study in all the hospitals of the city she availed herself indefatigably of this permission spending her days in inspecting hospitals infirmaries and religious houses and having the advantage of seeing the famous paris surgeons at their work now as at all times she was a diligent collector and student of reports returns statistics pamphlets among her papers of this date are elaborately tabulated analyses of hospital organization and nursing arrangements both in france and in germany and a circular of questions bearing on the same subjects which she seems to have addressed to the principal institutions in the united kingdom her evenings were spent in company with her host and hostess there were soirees dansant in the rue de bac she went once or twice with madame mole to balls elsewhere and also to the opera she met many english visitors and distinguished parisians having completed her general inquiries into the paris hospitals she presented herself to the reverend mother of the maison de la providence and had arranged a day for her admission when she was suddenly recalled to england by the illness of her grandmother who died at the age of ninety-five great has been the occasion for flo's usefulness wrote mr nightingale to his wife and i shall never be thankful enough wrote florence herself to her cousin in paris that i came i was able to make her be moved and changed and to do other little things which perhaps smoothed the awful passage and which perhaps would not have been done as well without me a family event of a different kind interested miss nightingale at this time her cousin blanche shore smith had become engaged to arthur hugh clough miss nightingale greatly liked him as a long engagement seemed likely miss nightingale interested herself in the future of the young couple discussing the proper limits of parental allowances in such matters drawing up elaborately detailed estimates of household expenditure not forgetting to include future charges for a young family as by the statistics of the average birth rate they might be calculated statistics were already almost a passion with her section two negotiations were now on foot for miss nightingale to take charge of a benevolent institution in london 
and madame mohl advised her to keep in their places the great ladies who were concerned in it neither now nor at any time was she much in love with committees but not every word in the following account of the negotiations need be taken very seriously to madame mohl lee hurst april eighth in all that you say i cordially agree and if you knew what the fashionable asses have been doing their offs and their ons poor fools you would say so ten times more i shall be truly grateful if you will write to pop my people know as much of the affair now as i do which is not much you see the f a s or a f s which will stand for ancient fathers and be more respectful as they are all puseyites the f a s want me to come up to london now and look at them and if we suit to come very soon into the sanatorium which i am afraid will preclude my coming back to paris especially if you are coming away soon for going there without you would unveil all my iniquities as the f a s are quite as much afraid of the r c s as my people are it is no use telling you the history of the negotiations which are enough to make a comedy in fifty acts they may be summed up as i once heard an irish shoeless boy translate virgil obstupui i was all the gither bothered stederunt que come my and my hair stood up like the bristles of a pig box faucibus heisit and divil a word could i say well divil a bit of a word can i say except that you are very good dear friend to take so much interest and that i shall be truly glad if you will write to pop dans le sang de mousse all your advice which i sent to mrs bracebridge i give my profoundest adhesion to i would gladly point the finger of scorn in the liveliest manner at the f a s and ride them roughshod round grosvenor square i will even do my very best but i am afraid it is not in me to do it as i should wish it would be only a poor feint a mean caricature but i will practise and you shall see me my people are now at thirty old burlington street where i shall be in another week please write to them there and if you can do a little quacking for me to them the same will be thankfully received in order that i may come in when i arrive not with my tail between my legs but gracefully curve round me in the old way in which perugino's devil wears it in folds round the waist i am afraid i must live at the place if i don't it will be a half and a half measure which will satisfy no one however i shall take care to be perfectly free to clear off without its being considered a failure at my own time i can give you no particulars dearest friend because i don't know any i can only say that unless i am left a free agent and am to organize the thing myself and not they i will have nothing to do with it but as the thing is yet to be organized i cannot lay a plan either before you or my people and that rather perplexes them as they want to make conditions that i shan't do this or that if you would well present my plans as you say to them it would be an inestimable benefit both to them and to me hilly will tell you all i know that it is a sanatorium for sick governesses managed by a committee of fine ladies but there are no surgeon students nor improper patients there at all which is of course a great recommendation in the eyes of the proper the patients or rather the impatients for i know that what it is to nurse sick ladies are all pay patients poor friendless folk in london i am to have the choosing of the house the appointment of the chaplain and the management of the funds as the f a s are at present minded but isaiah himself could not prophesy how they will be minded at eight o'clock this evening what specially annoyed miss nightingale was that some of the fashionable ladies in the course of gossip had begun to wonder whether her appointment would have the approval of her family some officious friend had suggested that it would be cruel to take her away from her home this difficulty was disposed of by miss nightingale's assurance that the appointment would be submitted to the approval of her mother and father her father now agreed to make her an independent allowance paid quarterly in advance it was on a scale sufficiently liberal to enable her to offer her services to the institution entirely gratuitously she also agreed to pay all the charges board and lodging included of the matron mrs clark whom she was to bring with her another difficulty was then raised the superintendent of a nursing home ought to be present when the doctors went their rounds and when operations were performed but would it be seemly for a gentlewoman to do this miss nightingale insisted 
and an agreement was arrived at in april she was to enter upon her duties as superintendent as soon as new premises had been secured and meanwhile she was free to resume her studies in paris section three she returned to paris on may thirty and after a week spent with monsieur and madame mole during which she again inspected various hospitals she entered the maison de la providence in the rue Oudinot on june eighth from paris she kept up correspondence with regard to the new premises for the institution in london the indispensable conditions of a suitable house are she wrote to lady canning june five first that the nurse should never be obliged to quit her floor except for her own dinner and supper and her patient's dinner and supper and even the latter might be avoided by the windlass we have talked about without a system of this kind the nurse is converted into a pair of legs secondly that the bells of the patients should all ring in the passage outside the nurse's own door on that story and should have a valve which flies open when its bell rings and remains open in order that the nurse may see who has rung the letter continues for some pages to describe other requirements about a hot water supply and the like points which are now in the a b c of hospitals or nursing homes but which then were novel counsels of perfection the idea of a lift in particular was new inquiries were made by the ladies in various parts of the country and there were many hitches before a suitable apparatus was installed the correspondence is significant of the attention to practical detail which characterized all miss nightingale's work meanwhile her work with the sisters of charity among the poor came to a tiresome pause the nurse had herself to be nursed the nature of the calamity is described in a letter to madame mohl who was paying visits in england at the time back drawing-room at madame mohl's rue de bac one twenty june twenty eighth my dearest friend do you see where i am here's a go as monsieur mohl told you here am i in bed in your back drawing-room poor monsieur mohl appears to bear it with wonderful equanimity and reconciliarment like his danseurs not so i it is the most impertinent the most surprising the most inopportune thing i have ever done me established in a lady's house in her absence to be ill if monsieur mohl had any sins i should think i was the avenging puka appointed to castigate him as he has none i am obliged to arrest myself at the other supposition that it is for my own it was not my fault though really here is how the things have happened i have had the measles at the sewer and of all my adventures of which i have had many and queer as will be never recorded in the book of my wanderings the dirtiest and the queerest i have ever had has been a measles in the cell of a sewer de la charite they were very kind to me and dear monsieur mole wrote to me almost every day and sent me tea which however they would not let me have and he lastly in his paternity would have me back where i came yesterday and established me in the back drawing-room to my infinite horror and now i am getting better very fast and mean to be out again in a day or two i had got rid of the eruption and all that before i came monsieur mohl is so kind and comes to see me and talk which i suppose is very improper but i can't help it and he has been like a father to me and never was such a father i really am so ashamed of all his kindness and the trouble i give them that my brazen old face blushes crimson and i assure you this paper ought to be read julie the servant is very kind to me but i hope not to be long on their hands as to my calamity itself it is like the mariage de mademoiselle who could have foreseen it it really was not my fault there was no measles at any of my posts and i had had them not eighteen months ago so that erect in the consciousness of that dignity i should not have kept out of their way if i had seen them the doctor would not believe i could have had them before well i am so ashamed of myself that i shall lock myself up for the rest of my life and never go nowhere no more for you see it is evident that providence who was always in my way and who as the superior said is très admirable meaning wonderful and having done this does not mean me to come to paris nor to the sewer having twice made me ill when i was doing so and given you all this trouble for me to come to paris to have the measles a second time is like going to the grand desert to die of getting one's feet wet or anything most unexpected please write to monsieur mole and comfort him for his disaster i am so repentant that i can say nothing 
which the catholics tell me is the mark of a true humiliation thank you a thousand times for all your kindness i come to england next week f n monsieur mole required no comfort miss nightingale's father wrote to thank him for his kindness to her the kindness he gallantly replied was on her side in giving him the advantage of her society and conversation her gentle manner he wrote july twenty five covers such a depth and strength of mind and thought that i am afraid of nothing for her but that her health should fail her End of part one of freedom paris and harley street eighteen fifty three to october eighteen fifty four part one chapter ten of the life of florence nightingale volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume one by edward tyus cook freedom paris and harley street continued part four convalescence was rapid on july thirteenth she returned to london and a month later on august twelfth eighteen fifty three miss nightingale went into residence in her first situation the place in question already briefly described in one of her letters to madame mohl was that of superintendent of an establishment for gentlewomen during illness this institution had been founded a few years before at eight chandos street cavendish square to give medical assistance and a home to sick governesses and other gentlewomen of narrow means it was managed by a council which in its turn appointed a committee of ladies and a committee of gentlemen we need not trouble ourselves with the relations between the two committees though they much troubled miss nightingale but it is characteristic of the ideas of the time that the ladies made over to the gentlemen all payments contracts and financial arrangements as also the selection of medical officers and male servants some years later kinglake devoted several pages of his most elaborate satire to a comparison of the male pretensions and the female performances in their respective spheres in the hospitals of the crimea but on the present occasion miss nightingale found the ladies more difficult than the gentlemen the institution had languished in chandos street she was called in to give it new life suitable new premises had been found at number one upper harley street and there miss nightingale lived with a few brief intervals until october eighteen fifty four she had also a pied a terre in some lodgings taken for her by her aunt in pell-mell where she occasionally saw her friends and whither she resorted on sunday mornings in order not to scandalize the patients in harley street by being known not to go to church she had stipulated for extensive powers of control and she was not one to let any agreed power suffer diminution from desuetude the ladies on the council and the committee included besides lady canning already mentioned lady ellesmere lady cranworth lady monteagle lady caroline murray and others well known in the worlds of society and philanthropy miss nightingale had her special friends and allies among them such as lady canning and lady inglis and mrs sidney herbert presently joined the committee in order to lend her support since their meeting in rome mrs herbert and miss nightingale had seen much of each other for wilton house was within calling distance of embley miss nightingale had assisted at the birth of one of mrs herbert's children and amongst miss nightingale's papers belonging to this period is a syllabus of religious teaching for a girl's school which they had adapted from the madre st columba's lessons to girls mrs herbert now wrote from wilton offering to come up to a committee meeting i thought some wicked cats might be there who would set up their backs and if so i should like to have mine up too and again i hope you will write to me dearest flo should any little difficulties arise whilst we are out of town difficulties did arise in plenty but miss nightingale was sometimes peremptory and at other times showed herself a master in the gentle art of managing committees 
to madame mole one upper harley street august twenty clarkey dear i would write but i can't i have had to prepare this immense house for patience in ten days without a bit of help but only hindrance from my committee if m mole would write a book upon english societies i would supply him with such statistics as would astonish even him but it's no use talking about these things and i've no time i have been in service ten days and have had to furnish an entirely empty house in that time we take in patience this monday and have not got our workmen out yet my committee refused me to take in catholic patients whereupon i wished them good morning unless i might take in jews and their rabbis to attend them so now it is settled and in print that we are to take in all denominations whatever and allow them to be visited by their respective priests and muftis provided i will receive in any case whatsoever that is not of the church of england the obnoxious animal at the door take him upstairs myself remain while he is conferring with his patient make myself responsible that he does not speak to or look at any one else and bring him downstairs again in a noose and out into the street and to this i have agreed and this is in print amen from committees charity and schism from the church of england and all other deadly sin from philanthropy and all the deceits of the devil good lord deliver us in great haste ever yours overflowingly it will do me so much good to see a good man again to her father one upper harley street december three eighteen fifty three dear papa you ask for my observations upon my line of statesmanship i have been so very busy that i have scarcely made any resume in my own mind but upon doing so now for your benefit i perceive when i entered into service here i determined that happen what would i never would intrigue among the committee now i perceive that i do all my business by intrigue i propose in private to a b or c the resolution i think a b or c most capable of carrying in committee and then leave it to them and i always win i am now in the heyday of my power at the last general committee they proposed and carried without my knowing anything about it a resolution that i should have fifty pounds per month to spend for the house and wrote to the treasurer to advance it me whereupon i wrote to the treasurer to refuse it me lady blank who was my greatest enemy is now i understand trumpeting my fame through london and all because i have reduced their expenditure from one shilling ten pence per head per day to one shilling the opinions of others concerning you depend not at all or very little upon what you are but upon what they are praise and blame are alike indifferent to me as constituting an indication of what myself is though very precious as the indication of the other's feeling last general committee i executed a series of resolutions on five subjects and presented them as coming from the medical men one that the successor to our house surgeon resigned should be a dispenser and dispense the medicines in the house saving our bill at the druggist's of a hundred and fifty pounds per annum two a series of house rules of which i send you the rough copy three a series of resolutions about not keeping patients of which i send you the foul copy four a complete revolution as to diet which is shamefully abused at present five an advertisement for the institution of which i send the foul copy all these i proposed and carried in committee without telling them that they came from me and not from the medical men and then and not till then i showed them to the medical men without telling them that they were already passed in committee it was a bold stroke but success is said to make an insurrection into a revolution the medical men have had two meetings upon them and approved them all nem con and thought they were their own and i came off with flying colours no one suspecting my intrigue which of course would ruin me were it known as there is as much jealousy in the committee of one another and among the medical men of one another as ever what's his name had of marlborough i have also carried my point of having good harmless mr blank as chaplain and no young curate to have spiritual flirtations with my young ladies and so much for the earthquakes in this little molehill of ours to her father i send you some more documentary evidence the tale of my quarterly report my committee are such children in administration that i am obliged to tell them such obvious truths as are contained in what i make the medical men say 
this place is exactly like the administering of the poor law we have cases of purely lazy fits and cases deserted by their families and my committee have not the courage to discharge a single case they say the medical men must do it the medical men say they won't although the cases they say must be discharged and i always have to do it as the stop-gap on all occasions by such hearts and by such readiness to shoulder responsibility Miss Nightingale reduced chaos to order, and her management of the institution won praise in all quarters. It was hard work, for the lady superintendent was here, there, and everywhere, shepherding those who had cure of souls, managing the nurses, assisting at operations, checking waste in the coal cellar or the larder. When a thing wanted to be done, she did it herself. Mrs. Herbert heard with anxiety that her friend had strained her back by lifting a patient though she was suffering from lumbago at the time there were smaller worries too the british workmen and the british tradesmen also tried her sorely the chemist she wrote to her father sent me a bottle of ether labelled s spirits of nitre which if i had not smelt it i should certainly have administered and should have had an inquiry into poisoning and the whole flue of a new gas stove came down the second time of using it which, if I had not caught it in my arms, would certainly have killed a patient. Then there were the anxieties necessarily incident to a nursing home. We have had an awful disappointment, she wrote to her father, 1854, in a couching for a cataract which has failed. The eye is lost, though no fault of Bowman's, and I have left after a most anxious watching with a poor blind woman on my hands, whom we have blinded, and with a prospect of insanity. I'd rather ten times have killed her. These are the cases, not those like the poor German who died, which make our lives so anxious. What was afterwards to characterize her work in a larger field was already observed in Harley Street. It was the combination of masterful powers of organization with womanly gentleness and sympathy. Letters of gratitude which she received from patients after their discharge from Harley Street speak of her unwearied and affectionate attention. They were often addressed to her as my good, dear, and faithful friend, or my darling mother. And a friend and mother she was indeed to many of the young women who came under her care. She had a large and influential circle of friends and acquaintances, and she was indefatigable in finding convalescent homes or sympathetic care or openings in the colonies for those who stood in need of such assistance. She was much interested in the scheme for female emigration, which Sidney Herbert had started in 1849, and in which he and his wife superintended every detail. Though the work was hard and the anxieties many, Miss Nightingale did not lose heart. Our vocation is a difficult one, she wrote to Miss Nicholson, January 10, 1854, as you, I am sure, know, and though there are many consolations and very high ones, the disappointments are so numerous that we require all our faith and trust but that is enough i have never repented nor looked back not for one moment and i begin the new year with more true feeling of a happy new year than ever i had in my life she had found her vocation but her family had not yet quite fully accepted it on their side there was still some looking back her father indeed took pride in his daughter's success and the correspondence between them at this time is very pleasant he was himself a county magistrate concerned in the administration of hospitals and asylums and he followed every move in his daughter's strategy with lively interest he admired her masterfulness but was not quite sure that she might not carry it too far you will have he wrote to govern by a representative system after all in england we go this way to work and a good way it is for a good autocrat is only to be found at intervals despots do nothing in teaching others republicans keep teaching each other all day long he was most sympathetic in her difficulties but he was not sure that those about him would be so there is a postscript in one of his letters which tells a good deal between the lines better write to me at the athenaeum so as not to excite inquiry her mother and sister seemed to have thought that while they were in london florence might have lived at home or at any rate have often been with them why should she be wearing herself out away from them their point of view was put by madame mole who was the affectionate friend of both sisters to madame mole harley street august twenty seventh eighteen fifty three i have not taken this step clarkie dear without years of anxious consideration it is the result of the experience of years and of the fullest and deepest thought 
it has not been done without advice and it is a step which being the growth of so long it is not likely to be repented of or reconsidered i mean the step of leaving them i do not wish to talk about it and this is the last time i shall ever do so but as you ask me a plain question clarkie dear i will give you a plain answer i have talked matters over made a clean breast as you express it with partha not once but thousands of times years and years have been spent in doing so it has been therefore with the deepest consideration and with the fullest advice that i have taken the step of leaving home and it is a fait accompli with regard to my sacrificing my peace and comfort it is true that i am here entirely for their sakes but to serve my country in this way has been also the object of my life though i should not have done it in this time or manner but it is not a sacrifice any more than that i have done a thing in a bad way which i should fain have done in a good one for this is sure to fail so farewell clarky dear don't let us talk any more about this it is as i have said before a fate accompli having at so great difficulty won her freedom florence clearly felt that any policy of half and half now might necessitate in the future a renewal of the struggle her sister was still in very delicate health and florence was advised by the family doctor himself that her visits involved much disturbing excitement besides the work at harley street if it was to be done efficiently required constant residence and unremitting attention and it was written he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me section five in august eighteen fifty four miss nightingale took a few days holiday at lee hurst where mrs gaskell the authoress was on a visit to mr and mrs nightingale it was then that mrs gaskell wrote the description of florence's personal appearance which has already been given page thirty nine mrs gaskell was struck no less by the beauty of her character she gave a sketch of miss nightingale's career and then continued it is not like st elizabeth of hungary the one efforts of her family to interest her in other occupations by allowing her to travel etc but the clinging to one object she must be a creature of another race so high and angelic doing things by impulse or some divine inspiration not by effort and struggle of will but she seems almost too holy to be talked about as a mere wonder mrs nightingale says with tears in her eyes alluding to anderson's fairy tales that they are ducks and have hatched a wild swan she seems as completely led by god as joan of arc i never heard of any one like her it makes me feel the livingness of god more than ever to think how straight he is sending his spirit down into her as into the prophets and saints of old and in another letter i am glad that miss blank likes north and south i did not think margaret was so over good what would she say to florence nightingale i can't imagine for there is intellect such as i never came in contact with before in woman only twice in man great beauty and of her holy goodness who is fit to speak a famous writer has said of the saints that the greatest and most helpful of them have always shown some wit or humour and of florence nightingale mrs gaskell noted further she has a great deal of fun and is carried along by that i think she mimics most capitally miss nightingale cut short her holiday on hearing that an epidemic of cholera had broken out in london she volunteered to give help with the cholera patients in the middlesex hospital she was up day and night receiving the women patients chiefly it seems outcasts in the district of soho undressing them and ministering to them the epidemic however subsided and she returned to her normal work in harley street section six the work there did not fail within its appointed scope but in another way the failure which miss nightingale had predicted in her letter to madame mole soon became apparent the scale of the undertaking was more restricted than florence had desired and she saw no means of widening it she had wanted to receive patients of all classes to enroll many volunteer nurses to have opportunities for training them among a wide circle both at home and abroad her knowledge and her talents were well understood and already in her correspondence for a year or two past she appears as a woman to whom reference was made as to one speaking with authority a missionary in paris applied to her for two well-qualified matrons alas she had to reply i have no fish of that kind she was making the most of her present opportunity but it was narrow some of her friends had thought from the first that she was wasting her powers on unsuitable soil in harley street monkton milnes who paid a 
visit to Embley in December 1853, wrote to his wife, They talk quite easily about Florence, but her position does not seem very suitable. I wish we could put her at the head of a juvenile reformatory. Her own primary object was to train nurses. And other friends, Mrs. Bracebridge among the number, advised her to leave Harley Street, since there she found no scope for so doing. King's College Hospital had just been rebuilt, and another friend, Miss Louisa Twining, opened negotiations in August 1854 for securing Miss Nightingale's appointment as superintendent of nurses there. Some of the medical men who had been impressed at Harley Street with her rare combination of gifts were most anxious that she should consent to take up such a post. Dr. William Bowman, in particular, strongly pressed her and was confident that if she agreed he could get the appointment en train in the autumn. Miss Nightingale's mother and sister sought as strongly to dissuade her. The sister laid stress on Florence's doubtful health. The mother added objections on the score of the medical students. They both urged that if she must do something of the kind, Great Ormond Street and work among children were more suitable and convenient. Florence herself was greatly drawn to King's College Hospital and began devising plans on the model of Kaiserswerth for enrolling a staff of nurses among farmers' daughters. But the immediate future hid in it another fate for Florence Nightingale. Thy lot or portion in life, said the Caliph Ali, is seeking after thee, therefore be at rest from seeking after it. So Miss Nightingale may have read in Emerson and in homelier phrase her good Aunt Mai had said to her, if you will but be ready for it, something is getting ready for you, and will be sure to turn up in time. Which things Florence, I doubt not, laid up in her heart. When news began to arrive from the east, did she recall a prophecy which had been made about her by a friend long before the Crimean War was dreamt of? Lady Lovelace, the daughter of Lord Byron, the Ada, sole daughter of my home and heart, had before her death in 1852 written a poem in honor of her friend, Florence Nightingale. I have quoted some of it already. The piece ends with a presage. In future years, in distant climes, should war's dread strife its victims claim, should pestilence, unchecked be time, strike more than sword, than cannon maim, he who then reads these truthful rhymes will trace her progress to undying fame. End of Freedom, Paris, and Harley Street continued.